I assume you are socially responsible and have watched enough television to be in a state of agitation, confusion and anxiety about the totally real and not manufactured climate crisis. Or are you one of those bigot science phobes who denies science and hates poor people and children? We are creating this movement every day because every day of inaction drives more action from us! I am afraid. How come why is the governments, corporations and media not listening to these suffering children's grassroots global movement? Climate activists need to support other social movements too. Because any fight for justice is your fight too. So when kids rally for gun safety or for LGBTQ plus rights, or when teachers ask for livable wages, get your butt out there and support them! I'm mad at my parents because look at where we're at right now. Like, we're all gonna suffer if we don't start doing something now. Wow. This is, like, so like, serious. That girl shook. These poor suffering children are suffering so much and just want the bad grown-ups to be good and take hashtag climate action now. Hey, Amelia here, and we're bringing you a very special episode of Newsbreak all about the global climate strike. Millions of students all over the world have hit the streets. This real global crisis requires an immediate global solution. I do not hate children. This is clearly grassroots, not astroturfed activism. Thanks, Amelia. I'm at a rally in Adelaide, and lots and lots of students have come out to take part. And I'm speaking with one of them now. Why is this such a big issue for so many kids? I think this is such a big issue for so many kids because our future is being decided entirely on the decisions that are being made today. This horrific global crisis requires an immediate global solution that we obviously don't have time to question or discuss. I do not hate children. I am not a bigot. This is an incredibly important cause and um, this is an opportunity for them to stand up for their futures and that's definitely worth missing school for. Everybody wants us to go to school and I want to go to school because I want to get educated. But climate change is so important that through school that I've learned that we need to actually do something and with our power we should all stand up and fight for what's right. Greta says the best thing people can do is start small because everyone has the power to make a difference. No one is too small to, to have an impact and change the world, so just do everything you can. In keeping with all things environment, let's check out some happy stories of people doing their bit to help save our planet. I, for one, am ready to accept the solutions to this completely legitimate and not a scam worldwide existential threat. Let's check out His Royal Highness Prince Khalid bin Al Walid's YouTube channel to see if plant based news is covering this breaking news of the hashtag climate crisis. Surely Klaus and the vegan movement will be taking appropriate action to face this imminent and immediate planetary threat that will surely destroy everything very soon if we don't take appropriate hashtag climate action right now. Than the rest of the earth temperatures over parts of the arctic will increase as much as 54 degrees fahrenheit this month our house is on fire our house is falling apart we are right now about 11 years away from that climate breakdown will become irreversible wow this is serious and this video is already a week old Let's see if the most recent videos have some solutions we can implement to combat this completely serious and imminent real global catastrophe. And we will never stop fighting. We will never stop fighting for this planet and for ourselves, our futures and for the futures of our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Three years ago, I guess, I'm not quite sure, but three years ago, roundabout, you radically changed the life of your family. You managed to have your family stop eating meat, for example. How did you do that? And what did it take to convince them? I... Not... Quite I am much. shaking with goosebumps right now. 
This brave grassroots 16-year-old human shield is on every television station in the world fighting for the solutions. I'm so glad there is a way to avert the imminent catastrophe that all the real science has proven will destroy everything if we don't take action now. If the adults don't sterilize themselves, put us on birth control, pay carbon taxes to the World Bank and IMF, move into a social engineered smart city and eat a plant-based diet of mass-produced kibble made from processed monocrop patented GMO plant foods, this poor 16-year-old human shield will not have a future. And so on. They always had excuses, but then I... I made them feel so guilty. You made them feel guilty? Yeah. I, I, told, I told... Bad news for your parents. Yeah. What's that? I, I you aren't convinced? Can't. What the fuck is wrong with you? Why are you stealing poor Greta's future? Why do you hate children and the planet? Why do you support murdering Bambi and Simba? And, and then they decided to, to do those changes because I have made them guilty. Now all of them are vegan. I'm so excited to be vegan like my heroes, Greta and Klaus. Let's check in on Bill Gates, selfless philanthropist, friend of former champion of science and fellow philanthropist Jeffrey Epstein. He must be working to help us face this real, credible death threat from the climate. Some people don't recognize how important Nigeria is. In Sub-Saharan Africa, almost a quarter of the people live in one country. I'm here with my friend, Aliko Dangote. A lot of people, they are not really aware of the malnutrition issues that we have in Nigeria. Malnutrition is such a gigantic problem. Part of it is just getting enough food. But another part is getting various vitamins, micronutrients. Rejoice. Really Bill Gates, major shareholder in Monsanto and Beyond Meat, and his friend, the richest man in Africa, are putting extra special vitamins and minerals in the industrial plant-based GMO kibble they want to feed all of Africa and the world with. Saving the planet and not eating meat or animal foods never felt so good. If we could get more GMO corn and soy into Africa, we can stop the hashtag climate crisis. And now, whatever that we produce in Dongote Group, whatever you eat, you have micronutrients there. Here we've got flour that's got the vitamin A in it. Here we've got salt with iodine in it. We gathered 13 of the CEOs that produce 80% of the foods that we sell in Nigeria, and they committed to adding nutrients into whatever they are producing. Which will have a big impact on health. What we just want is for the government regulatory agencies to make sure that, yes, it is enforced everywhere. It is enforced everywhere. I trust in this and, and want the government help. to put nutrients in all my kibble. Equality is delicious and nutritious. have a huge impact on all of Africa. I'm so relieved. Let's go back to plant-based news and find some more evolutionary vegan solutions to the truly imminent climate Armageddon. Looks like plant-based news has taken a day off from fighting the real and not made up hashtag climate crisis to make a sponsored recipe video ad for a fake vegan cheese made by a company that mass produces real cheese in the UK. Great timing. It's been nearly an hour since this newly converted well, starving news. vegan has had an unnecessary uh, vegan yeah, snack. Today, Nothing stokes the revolutionary the fire in my vegan soul like a healthy, sustainable there. fake well, vegan cheese meal in my smart Georgia, city coffin apartment. I feel so good about cheese. myself. I feel so happy and not malnourished. And I am ecstatic and smiling inside. I do not want to cry. And it's just completely dairy free. So if you are lactose intolerant, then that's, you know, this is a great alternative for you too. So when it came, we were pretty um, surprised in a great way at yeah. how good and realistic it is. It's so good. It's lovely raw and it melts amazingly, yeah. isn't it too? Mm -hmm. So we're going to make some really good recipes. This one I'm really excited about because it's This um, recipe and lifestyle is so cheese. acceptable and, and it's really healthier for myself uh, and the planet than real food. This is a sustainable vegan meal of fake cheese fried in Roundup fortified wheat flour and GMO vegetable oil. I do not wish this was real animal foods. I am very empowered against the hashtag climate crisis. I am not deceived. We are all one. I can become a god. I am being the best version of myself. 
I am being the change that I want to see in the changes that must come in these changing times to come. The animals will thank me if I get a vasectomy. The climate crisis is going to kill everything if we don't all do this. I am happy and choose this. I like making vegan recipes like the people on the screen. I am smiling large inside. My mother is the earth and my father is a closet heterosexual. We evolved from cosmic sludge. I will stop craving real animal foods eventually. I feel healthy. Veganism is desirable and easy. I would gladly pay a carbon tax to the World Bank. Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide. I am saving the planet. The climate is changing and if I don't eat this instead of real animal foods that 16 year old human shield won't get her future back from the abusive grown ups. I am not deceived. I am not in denial. I am an activist. Microphone is working. Live on Rockfin, live on YouTube. What's up, guys? What's up, bigots and bigettes? We are here. We are here amplifying. We're here to amplify bigoted voices for all of you. Uh, we've got a bunch of people in the chat over on YouTube. Rockfin's kicking off. All right. All right, guys. We're talking food shortages. We're talking coom pods and the sexual revolution and the engineering, all right? The engineering and the manufacturing of discontent, of agitation in the name of bringing about revolutionary activity. We are talking about the revolution. This has been a theme of well, the last few years on the channel here. And we've been especially focusing on a few different texts the last uh, few months. And we're still, we're still diving deep into these texts. One of these books, Fire in the Minds of Men by James H. Billington. We're going to be diving a little bit more into some of the material that Billington presents here in his book, The Origins of the Revolutionary Faith. We're going to be looking at how what we see happening now at a mass scale, at a global scale, what we see happening right now globally, this is nothing new, right? This is a system, a spirit, a worldview that's been very prominent over the last few centuries. That revolutionary worldview is what brought about the French Revolution. And the roots of this, what we see happening right now, the roots of this go back to the Bolshevik Revolution, of course. Right? And we've been drawing comparisons to the Bolshevik Revolution and looking at the historical parallels of the Bolshevik Revolution and how today's Fourth Industrial Revolution, right, the, uh, the, oops, I just had to, all right, we still live on Rockfin? You guys let me know. Today's fourth industrial revolution, today's technocratic revolution, is only an extension of the forces and the fire and the sparks and the flames and the bloodshed that were unleashed in the 1917 revolution that led to the rise of the Bolsheviks. But the roots of that go back, of course, to the French Revolution. All right, so all these manipulation tactics, all of these agitation tactics... These are not new. And of course, they didn't just magically happen in a vacuum during the French Revolution, right? So we have been exploring the history of ideas that ties into this as well. The history of the idea of the ideas of the Enlightenment, right? The ideals of the Enlightenment that stemmed out of the Renaissance. The, uh, the materialism that drives the worldviews of Darwinism, that led to kind of the nihilistic, destructive, revolutionary forces. This is what we're looking at today. And it's, it's, uh, it's getting crazy out there. All right, we've got, where are we at? Here we go. We've got food shortages. Food shortages. Who, who's been warning about these possible incoming food shortages for several years now? Right? Well, nobody watching this is likely surprised. Nobody watching this is likely surprised. But what? some of you might be surprised by 
And some of you probably already know this. If you've been paying attention, if you've been watching our streams here, some of you may be surprised that food shortages, famine, and the like have been used as agitation techniques many times in order to bring about regime change, in order to bring about major societal changes, structural changes, and even revolutionary outbursts. <clears throat> so we are starting with the food, the food supply. They've been telling you, get in your, get in your pods, live in a tiny home, live, live the van life. Right, be a, as, uh, as Jacques Attali in his book said, a, um, a digital nomad, right? a nomad connected to a digital surveillance grid right? with no roots, with no connection to the land, no connection to a place that you call home, no real home at all. Be rootless, be a, a, uh, a rootless, mobile, bug-eating pod dweller, right? You can, you can get your pod on wheels, or you can get your little tiny home, you know, your, your eight-square-foot apartment, your eight-square-foot literal coffin apartment, you live in a van down by the river. <laughs> and all right here we go food 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 what do you put in your body right food as a weapon of warfare obviously food is crucial for all of us we all need food you need food to live did you know that fun fact you need to freaking eat food <laughs> fun fact you can't just not eat food Fun fact, the price of food has been increasing dramatically, and our ability to get decent foods has been decreasing dramatically, right? Um, I got my, my illegal, I got my contraband right here. Look at this, look at this. Oh, it's so... Guys, cover your eyes. Cover your eyes if you have sensitive eyes. This is, you know, maybe not safe for work. If you are at the office, perhaps this is not safe for work. Look at that. That is, look at that, it's, it's labeled beef. <laughs> this, you guys, this is what beef looks like. For those of you who are watching, no, I'm just kidding, this is, uh, it's milk. I guess beef broth was in this jar before. But like raw milk basically made illegal in many states in the U.S. and many countries. In Canada, it's almost impossible to get raw milk. If you want to get raw milk, you have to get it uh, for animals or for bathing if you're in Australia. Right? You can't even get raw milk. Milk has to be pasteurized. It has to be sterilized because, oh, we just care so much about your health, right? We care so much about your health. So we have to industrialize production of food to an insane extent. And all has to be, uh, it's all going to be sterilized. Right? So, you know, we, the foods you eat, if you can get locally produced raw milk, if you can get locally produced animal foods, you're stoked because not many of us have access to this stuff. Not many of us have access to this stuff. Not everybody's able to have animals. Not everybody wants to have animals. But moving towards actually producing some of our own food, this is crucial. Right? Being able to have food in a time of possible shortage is important, right? Storable food, yeah, you can, you can store a decent amount of food, but storable food, the nutrition quality, nowhere near what you're getting from fresh foods. All right, so fresh animal foods, raw milk, real foods. Our access to these things has been limited dramatically just through economic forces, right? Economic government intervention as well with the subsidizing of, <clears throat> the subsidizing of, where did that article go? There it is. With the subsidizing of uh, mass-produced, low-cost, but heavy capital required for production foods, we have all seen 
the price of real foods skyrocket. Yeah, but this isn't necessary, right? I mean, our lifestyle, our access to food is determined by our choices, right? where we choose to live, who we choose to give our money to as far as food production goes. We have choice. We have choice, thankfully. Now, how long we'll have choice about these things, about what we put in our bodies, um, that, that's the question, right? So we got the FDA right now is making a huge push. This is really important. The FDA is making a huge push to essentially bring about full FDA control over all supplements, all dietary supplements. We're talking freaking vitamins. Every supplement will have to get approval from the FDA. Massive, massive government oversight over supplements. And of course, this makes sense, right? With all these uh, encroachments on uh, you know, choice over what we put in our body. All our encroachments on choice of what we put in our body. Uh, now supplements are under, are under attack. So top senator is looking to add language requiring dietary supplement reporting to must-pass legislation governing the FDA's user fees. The Dietary Supplement Listing Act of 2022, introduced by Senate Majority Whip Dick Durbin, Tuesday would boost Food and Drug Administration oversight of dietary supplements to better identify potentially harmful ingredients. Or health claims. Health claims. So it's, oh, harmful ingredients. We're, we're, we want to protect you from health claims. What do you mean? What do you mean health claims? All right. So health claims could be true, right? But the FDA says they're not true. Oh, sorry. The FDA is going to have to protect you. FDA is going to have to protect you. They're going to ban, they're going to ban those supplements. They're going to hide them from you. All right, so this is crazy. We got to make sure people understand that clampdowns are common. Clampdowns are coming on these things, right? My uh, our buddy from over at Chalk C H O Q dot com C H O Q dot com sent me this. So a little reminder, right? If you want to be healthy, they are encroaching on your rights to have access to things like adaptogens, natural herbs, natural supplements. The FDA wants to regulate all that and regulate health claims, health claims. So they're going for like pharmaceutical level regulation over supplements that people have taken for years, right? People have used Tongcat, the Tongcat 100 extract here in Chalks. Where is it? Come on, there we go. In Chalks, Tongcat 100. Right? This is a super adaptogen that people have used for thousands of years. People have been using this herb, and this is all wild crafted, like highest quality stuff. So make sure to hit up chalk.com, chalk.com. Get your hands on some of that Tongcat 100 extract. Right? For the dudes, I'm trying to make my camera focus. For the dudes, significant boost in not only your immune system function, but also testosterone production. For the ladies, benefits as far as reproductive health as well right not trying to not trying to get too graphic here <laughs> but for the ladies libido boost improvements in reproductive health and in immune system function from that tomcat 100 as well as the daily also great especially for the mans for the mans out there i also really i enjoy the shilajit extract i take that every day that's the chalk shilajit extract right all of our soil completely depleted our body is very depleted of minerals. That chalk shilajit extract standardized, and I think it's like 50% humic acids. They're very mineral rich to help uh, balance out your body's hormone production, balance out your immune system. Hit up chalk.com, use that coupon code BIG50. You use that BIG50, you're going to get 50% off everything store wide, or, or even better for you guys, you can get 53% off on all monthly subscriptions, right? So you can subscribe to individual products like the Shilajit, like the Purified Shilajit, or like the Ashwagandha Extract, which is another adaptogen that helps you to calm your central nervous system, decrease stress hormone production, right? That Tongcat 100 Extract also calms and soothes the immune system and the nervous system and helps to decrease cortisol production and decrease stress hormone production. Now remember, cortisol is not bad, but if it's produced at the wrong time, 
produced in the wrong quantities and produced chronically, that can lead to major health issues. So hit up chalk.com, chalk.com. You get 53% off on all subscriptions if you use Big 53 Life. All right, that's B-I-G, Big, as in Bigot, Big 53 Life. And you can get access to that 53% off on all subscriptions for life over there at chalk.com. But they're coming for the supplements. They are coming for the freaking supplements, and they're coming hard. Just like they're coming for the food, they're coming for the supplements. All right, so just a little warning there about the uh, <clears throat> you know, possible encroachment on our ability to, uh, to be able to get decent food and decent supplements, which are always under attack. All right, so food plant fires fuel conspiracy theory. <laughs> U.S. News. Angelo Fischer from AP says a fire at Purdue Farms soybean facility in Virginia on Saturday was relatively small. Firefighters had, a, uh, fighters had it under control after about an hour of arriving, and the plant remains fully operational. It was an accidental fire, so there's nothing suspicious about all these fires, right? These are just, these are just conspiracy theories. These are the most recent fodder for a conspiracy theory that suggests fires at food processing plants and other facilities are part of an effort to undermine the U.S. food supply. Because who would ever want to undermine the food supply, right? Nobody would want to do that. Nobody would want to undermine the food supply. That just doesn't make sense. Why would anybody want to do that? Why would anybody do that? Why would anybody want to make food more expensive? Fire safety stakeholders respond to food plant fires rumors. There's rumors of a wave of intentional fires at U.S. food plants, brews on the internet, powder and bulk solids asked fire safety experts for their take on the theory. So claims of a suspicious trend. Trend is in um, quotations there. So this is just a conspiracy theory, guys. Don't worry. Don't worry. More than 18 fires at U.S. food facilities in recent months. It's not, a th it's not a trend. That's not a trend. That's just a few isolated incidents that has nothing to do with anything. Nothing, absolutely nothing to do with anything. It's got, it ain't got nothing to do with nothing. It little, it's called, there's a little fire here and there, right? It's called, you know, maybe we, a little bit of inflation, a little bit of gas prices going up, a little bit of chaos, a little bit of mass propaganda, pornography to ruin your brains, to get your children addicted, to release the passions so that you become enslaved to the passions and foolishly chase those passions and act like animals. It's called a little bit of agitation using mass media to get you pissed off at your government so that you can get out into the streets of eventually and shout slogans so that we can bring in the new system of technocratic control and you could feel like you're you know maybe a part of it maybe demanding it or something it's called we do a little gaslighting to make you think that hey yeah it's all just normal it's called we do a little world revolutionary fermentation you know a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> but don't you guys are you're idiots if you think that this is that this is some sort of a, some sort of an intentional thing, right? This is just random. This is just totally random. Random fires. Food processing plant in northwest Fresno. This has nothing to do with anything. From the building last firefighters put out the flames. Officials with the business have not yet said what was damaged. The cause of the fire is under investigation. Hours later, firefighters responded to an ammonia leak at the same building. No word yet whether the leak was related to the fire. It's literally nothing. Literally nothing. Investigation underway to determine what sparked a fire at a food processing plant in northwest Fresno. Fire Pico, broke out developing now. at Saladino's plant at Shaw Avenue and Golden State Boulevard Sunday night. Officials with the business have not yet said what was damaged. Firefighters responded to an ammonia leak. Not clear. Okay. So the text of this is just the same as the video. But, you know, what, what's going on here? What's going on? What's really going on with these food facility fires? Okay, so we've got April 14th, 
A plane crashes into an Idaho potato and food processing plant, killing the pilot. April 22nd, Covington, Georgia firefighters responded to a plane crash that killed two people Thursday at the General Mills food processing plant. So within one week, within eight days, you've got two planes crashing in two different states, right? East Idaho and Covington, Georgia. <laughs> you've got two planes crashing into food processing facilities. That's just normal. That's just normal, guys. Come on, sweaty. What do you think? This is some sort of a conspiracy. You think the freaking, you think the lizard people eating the pizza and the, the $60,000 hot dogs are going to go and fly to the moon base where Hillary Clinton is on Guantanamo Bay eating babies? You, you think, you think it's some sort of a conspiracy? Like, Ooh, maybe elections get tampered with, and maybe sometimes what the media says isn't true. You think, oh, yeah, the, the media lies to you, and the moon is a giant block of cheese where Hillary Clinton is eating the babies. Come on, freaking stupid-ass, sweaty retards. This is not, this doesn't, none of that stuff happens. What are you, some kind of idiot? What are you, some kind of freaking... Stupid person. Sit down and shut up. Take your medication. Have some promiscuous, meaningless sex. Right? You probably you you're probably you're probably just crazy. You're totally crazy. Totally insane. <laughs> plane crash two within two weeks, two plane crashes. Near food processing plants. Strange, right? February 5th, massive fire sweeps through Wisconsin River meets in Mauston. Destroying part of the facility. February 22nd, Shearer's food plant in Hermiston, Oregon caught fire after a propane boiler exploded. March 17th, a structure fire at Walmart Distribution Center in Plainfield, Indiana. Okay, 1,000 employees inside, none injured. That's good, none injured. You're not, you're not seeing people injured in these. March 22nd, fire broke out at Nestle Hot Pockets plant. <laughs> Dang. I tell you what, those Hot Pockets were extra hot. <laughs> oh, you know the conspiracy theorists are going to have a good time with that one, don't you? Yeah, that's right. Bunch of idiots. Bunch of idiots. Now on to bigger news. <laughs> Officials believe a deep frying machine behind the fire destroyed a potato processing facility in Belfast on March 25th. April 13th, firefighters in Maine battled a massive fire destroying a butcher shop and meat market. April 30th, processing a tank for soybeans caught fire at Purdue Farms plant in Chesapeake, Virginia. I mean, a lot of these are big, a lot of these are big, uh, big facilities. A lot of these are large processing facilities. But no, I mean, this, this is just, this must be some sort of a, some sort of coincidence, right? Some sort of coinkadink. So what's going on? Is this a nefarious conspiracy of arsonist terrorists, foreign assets? At this point, there's no evidence of that and no reason to think that it's the case. So, I don't know. Is, is, this, is this some sort of a strange coincidence or is there something going on? Is there something going on? We're going to explore that today. So, food as a weapon. Food shortages. Food shortages. This is something that has been used many times. Many, many times. Famine, food shortages, and the like have been used to foment chaos. To bring about destruction. And the revolutionaries have used this as a tool going all the way back to going all the way back to the French Revolution. All right, so in the French Revolution, I got a, just a couple quotes here from a pretty important work. Now, this is a work by an author who's much maligned in contemporary culture. Nesta Webster in her book, The French Revolution, A Study in Democracy. Nesta Webster 
fascinating author, actually. I mean, she was quoted by Winston Churchill several times in the 1920s. Uh, Churchill quite liked her take on the Bolshevik Revolution. Churchill obviously read her book on the French Revolution and on World Revolution. And I, th I, think, uh, I think it's really fascinating that Winston Churchill, one of the heroes of normie culture, one of the, you know, the, world, the great World War II hero, <laughs> Winston Churchill, was quoting from this author, Webster, Nesta Webster, she is now called, you know, uh, all the, she's called all the buzzwords, you know, she a conspiracy theorist, she crazy, she must be crazy, but, you know, when you read her books, she actually does cite all the claims that she makes, right, now whether all the connections that she makes are valid, I think a little bit of further research would show that she's not far off at all, in fact, maybe she even understates certain strange threads uh, that are woven throughout the tapestry of history of the revolution. Um, so her book, The French Revolution, is a great supplementary read uh, for understanding the book Fire in the Minds of Men by James H. Billington. So Fire in the Minds of Men on the Origins of the Revolutionary Faith by Billington. This book, this book is, a, is, is incredible. This book is, is a massively important work. Yeah, but it's not a like chronological exploration of the French Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution. It's more of a, a an exploration of the worldview and of the influences and of the people of the revolutionaries. Whereas Webster's book, The French Revolution, does give you kind of a step by step step by step breakdown of exactly what happened in the French Revolution. So, um, Food shortages, scarcity, famine, scarcity, famine, food shortages. These are weapons. These are weapons. There we go. Matt over here on Rockfin. Thank you for that $2 tip, dude. Matt dropping $2 tip on Rockfin says, this all seems very familiar. Why does history repeat itself? <laughs> I mean, that, that would require, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of valid answers to that question. Why does history repeat itself? And thank you for that $2 tip, man. We're going to talk about that today. Why does history repeat itself? I mean, you, when you look at history, what you're looking at is not just a series of disconnected events and dates and, uh, and, and wars and random occurrences that lead us to where we are. You're looking at a narrative. You're looking at the actions of people and of cultures driven by beliefs, driven by their worldviews. Yeah, so... I think to understand why, why does history repeat itself, you look at history through a lens. You have to look at history through a lens. And the lens that I'm coming from is from the Orthodox Christian worldview. Right? So we see man as fallen, right? not taking into account the fall is removing proper anthropology from our historical analysis. So man is fallen. Right? We believe that there is good and evil. But we believe that man has free will. Man is influenced in how he uses his free will by his environment, by his culture. But ultimately, it's man's choice, what he does. It's your choice if you're, if you're going to be, you know, a, uh, if you're, if you're going to perform horrific acts or if you're going to be merciful or if you're going to perform acts of kindness. It's your choice. So man does have free will. That will is ours. That will is a gift from God. And man is made in the image and likeness of God. Right now, the history of the revolution, how we see the revolution, how we see these movements for chaos, control, destruction, anarchy, overthrow of you know, the patriarchy, overthrow of you know, the superstitions of religion, the superstitions of the past and of tradition. The people that are doing this are doing this because they hold certain beliefs. They believe they're going to get something out of this. Now, it's not all, it's not all rational behavior, right? There's this aspect of man and of man's fallen nature that leads us to use our free will often in a very destructive way. So this is why, you know, studying history, studying scripture, 
all right, the lives of saints, hagiography, which the revolutionaries have their own hagiography. They have their own lives of revolutionary saints who are, you know, usually blasphemous coomer, <laughs> like full-on degenerate nihilists. But they venerate these people. They have their own, they have their own apostolic succession. Right? Going from uh, Vaishopt to Buonarati, Restif, Neshaev, Lenin, Stalin, right? You have, you have a direct lineage of the, where these ideas flowed through, through the generations. And then the behavior ends up being cyclical, right? You see the same cycles of behavior of stoking chaos by some of these people who are, who are essentially agents of chaos. Many of these people are, are, are agents of destruction. Now, what, they think they're doing good, of course. They think, well, we have to destroy the old order in order to bring over, about a new order. We've got to destroy the old ways of life. We've got to destroy this tradition. We've got to destroy these old superstitions. to bring out a scientific way of living based on reason, right? Reason, human reason. They have to live by the laws of reason and logic. Therefore, we have to, you know, reduce 90% of the population. Um, as in Dostoevsky's book, The Demons, which we're going to talk about today as well, one of the pinnacle characters in this, Shugalyov. Shugalyov gives this long, meandering presentation. It's like several pages long in the book about how in order to bring about this rational order, we have to from the very outset, throw away reason altogether. He says, I start with the premise of unlimited freedom, ending with the premise of unlimited despotism. But this is how it must be, he says. Right? So in order for everybody to be free, we have to have unlimited despotism. Liberty, fraternity, equality. Right? Liberty, liberty and equality, I mean, these are, these are slogans that came right out of the Grand Orient Lodges, right? the Grand Orient Freemasonry. Liberty and equality. Those are two terms that are diametrically opposed. What is liberty? Right? These, are these vague terms. Well, if you have absolute liberty, how can you have absolute equality? <laughs> because as soon as you block somebody's freedom and liberty and ability to, say, you know, dominate somebody else, as the Darwinists, the might makes right, Darwinists believe is rational and scientific, as soon as you block that liberty of somebody to be an animal and dominate and spread, you know, uh, chaos and fire and death, well, then you're impinging upon their liberty, right? They're, they're try you're impinging on somebody's liberty by trying to bring about equality. But the revolutionaries, say, uh, their, their slogan, their, their unholy trinity of liberty, fraternity, and equality, right? liberty, equality, fraternity, what... How can you have all these things? All right, just at the starting point, you have a tension between these ideas that's unreconcilable. You can't reconcile this. <laughs> it's absurd. So why do we see the same thing? Why do you see the same cyclical actions? Because people start with the same starting point. They start with the, sta the same starting point of demanding unlimited freedom and unlimited equality and it's self-refuting what do you mean by freedom when you get when you come down to it at the at the, at the basis of it you have you have like a, a, a theological and metaphysical claim that's being made freedom is a metaphysical concept freedom has to do with with absolutes right with universals freedom has to do with god with free will so, unlimited freedom. We have free will, right? But what the revolutionaries want is freedom to impose their will on all the cosmos. <laughs> it's a twisted free will. It's a twisted version of freedom that destroys freedom. I'm tempted to find this quote in Dostoevsky's Demons. Actually, we will, we will talk a little bit about this. We will read a few quotes today because, you know, literature 
is just as important as, as history for understanding this goofball d insanity that we see right now. The goofy ass insanity of artificial crew, uh, food crises, artificial um, uh, inflation, all these unnecessary things, this economic warfare that's being waged in order to slowly and surely bring about a controlled outburst of the passions in the masses so that a new system, a new order can be imposed. Yeah, so food crisis, food crisis, this is something that is used to bring about the destruction and the chaos that the revolutionaries need in order to reformat society. Right? And, and within the groups of revolutionaries, when you read a book like Fire in the Minds of Men, or when you study the history of the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, you got different factions. You have anarchists, right? the anarchists whose starting point of absolute liberty is the most important thing. Then you've got the socialists, the communists, the socialists who focus on the equality being the biggest, most important, you know, deified ideal that they got. And the anarchists usually don't have an idea of an end point. What is this culture going to look like when we build it? A lot of them are very, very much focused on the, the, what Father Sarah from Rose called the, the nihilism of annihilation. They're, they're focused on destruction. So when you read somebody like uh, Bakunin <laughs> or Sergei Nechayev, Sergei Nechayev, this Kumer looking, looking dweeb, who's revolutionary, where is he? Look at that Kumer. Nechayev, whose revolutionary catechism is, I mean, it reads like, like any pissed off nihilist Zoomer's uh, manifesto. I mean, it's retarded. You read it and it's just like, <sighs> The revolutionary is a doomed man. <laughs> he has no personal interests, no business affairs, no emotions, no attachments, no property, and no name. Everything in him is wholly absorbed in the single thought and the single passion of revolution. The revolutionary knows that in the very depths of his being, not only in words but also in deeds, he has broken all the bonds which tie him to the social order and the civilized world with all its laws, moralities, and customs, and with all its generally accepted conventions. He is their implacable enemy, and if he continues to live with them, it is only in order to destroy them more speedily. So here in Nechayev, who was influenced and groomed by Bakunin, another Russian nihilist associated, of course, with the lodges, with Illuminism. You read this stuff, I mean, it's just, it's just satanic. It's just hateful, spiteful. But what, it, what, you see, what you see here is not an expression of like a single isolated deranged being. What you see here is the result, the logical result of what happened with the Enlightenment, what happened with you know, the Protestant Revolution, or I'm sorry, the Reformation, which all the revolutionaries saw as a revolution and as the Kickstarter for what they wanted to bring about, which was a further toppling of patriarchy, of order, and an attack and a storming of heaven. This is what it's all about. It's about storming heaven. It's about creating a utopia without God. It's about creating the man-God, not joining yourself to the God-man is Christ. It's about a rejection of Christ. This is really the root of the revolution. What is the antidote to the revolution? What is the antidote to this? What is the solution? What is the antidote to man's fall? It's Christ. It's uniting to Christ. Right? God became man so that man might become one with God. That's, that's the answer to this. So when, you, when you're looking at characters like Nechayev here, when you're looking at characters even uh, like, like Elon Musk, or when you're looking at like a, you know, a, a not so obviously revolutionary, but a little bit more moderate liberal, which by today's standard, Musk is more like a moderate liberal. <clears throat> 
he has revolutionary ideas. He, he, he agrees with all the revolutionaries. <laughs> when, you read, when you read literature, brilliant literature like Dostoevsky, you do get a window into the human soul better than when you just read history, right? So I think history, combining history with literature is super important. Just kind of what we've been trying to drive this home lately here and what we're going to further explore as we go deeper into Dostoevsky's ideas in his book, Demons. Sometimes the title is translated as devils, sometimes it's translated as the possessed. I think the, the title Demons would probably be the best translation. But there are no demons in the actual book overtly, but they're present in everything. They're present in the, in, the, in the unhinged rantings of the nihilist character Pyotr Stepanovich who goes on these, this long diatribe about how we have to bring about absolute destruction of the order, destruction of the family, generations of, of, of degradation and degeneration. He said we need several generations of just absolute chaos and then we can emerge from this as kings. We're we going to be kings. We're going to be Kangs. We're going to be Kangs after the revolution. We'll be Kangs of the Coomers. We'll be the Kang of the Coomers. The Coomer Kangs. <laughs> when you read literature like Dostoevsky, you see that what you're looking at in history is the playing out of the struggle within individual human souls and the souls of nations. All right, so food, for the food supply, food supply, food shortages, this is something that the revolutionaries used in the French Revolution. So here, Webster in her book, The French Revolution, A Study in Democracy, which was published in, what year was this? 1919. 2019, 1919, published out of London. She says, it is probable, however, that these schemes would have proved unavailing to produce a revolution had not the country at this crisis been faced with famine. Looking back on the beginnings of the revolution, Hua was convinced that but for the threatened famine, the people would have remained indefinitely submissive to the old regime everywhere. They know how to endure, to expect from time improvements that often do not come, but for which they continue to hope. They know only present evils, and of these, famine alone is intolerable to them. When you take away their bread and circuses, then, then the people will revolt. You don't let them eat their cake, as they claimed Marie Antoinette said. It's actually very likely she didn't say that. But bread and circuses is what they want. These people believe, and if you take away their bread, then you piss them off. I mean, this make you, you, you look at a child, right? You look at a child around lunchtime. <laughs> a child doesn't get breakfast on time. They start getting breakdowns, right? You hang out with a 10-year-old or a 5-year-old every day. You can, tell they're, they're, uh, <laughs> you can tell when they're hungry. They get hangry. Adults do as well, right? We're just sometimes better at hiding it from ourselves than others. <laughs> so, it uh, says... Uh, they know only present evils, and of these, famine alone is intolerable to them. Struck by this terrible scourge, it is not a change in the state that they demand, it is bread. So the French people would long have endured their accustomed burdens. They would have continued to pay taxes, tithes, to carry out feudal duties, to bend beneath the corvée and of other miseries of vassaldom. I find the proof of their patience and the means employed to them lose it. Uh, in, employed to make them lose it, rather. I find the proof of their patience and the means employed to make them lose it their patience. It was here that the conspirators saw their greatest opportunity. Bread, says Hua, was the potent lever by which the people were roused to action. What lies, what fables were thrown to public credulity. It is evident from all accounts that the famine was more fabulous than real. The people were not starving, but haunted by the fear of starvation. And to this fear was added exasperation, owing to the conviction that no real scarcity of grain existed. There wasn't a scarcity of grain. This is what's important. No real scarcity of grain existed. It was true that a fearful, fearful, fearful hailstorm 
<laughs> that, say that 10 times fast. Fearful hail, hail storm in July of the previous year had destroyed many of the crops around Paris, but had not the minister Necker declared that in spite of this disaster, the stores of grains in the country were more than sufficient to supply the needs of the nation until the next harvest? The want of bread in itself is bad enough, but to believe that bread is being willfully withheld from one is enough to stir the meekest to revolt. This was the lever employed by the conspirators. When the peasants of France, creeping to their doors, saw wagons laden with wheat winding their way through the village street, voices were not lacking to whisper, There is corn in plenty, but it is not for you. It is to be stored for the court, the aristocrats, the rich who will feast in plenty while you go hungry, and forthwith the maddened people would hurl themselves on the sacks of corn and filling them, into, uh, and fling them into the nearest river. The fact that in many cases the corn was destroyed and not appropriated by the people proves that hunger was less the incentive to revolt than rage at the monopolizers, and if the name of a supposed monopolizer were but whispered likewise, the unfortunate man fell a victim to the same fate as the sacks of corn. It is, of course, impossible to defend such excesses, yet if, during a time of scarcity, there were really profiteers enriching themselves at the expense of the people, the fury of the peasants is certainly, certainly justified. Their guilt must therefore be measured by the facts on which their suspicions were found. Was the scarcity of grain then imaginary or real? Undoubtedly, it was not to be entirely accounted for by the failure of the crops. So this again, 1789. 1789 grain shortage. There was no real grain shortage. There was plenty of grain. There was actually a lot of grain. <laughs> it was withheld by the people, and what you had was a monopoly on the distribution of this grain and artificial scarcity caused by distribution, food chain shortages, food supplies were not short. It was the means of getting it to people. So was the scarcity of grain then imaginary or real? Undoubtedly, it was not to be entirely accounted for by the failure of the crops. On this point, contemporaries of all parties agree. So even the revolutionaries after the fact, the, the contemporary of the revolution, the contemporaries of the revolution, they all agreed that no, there was no real shortage of grain. On this point, the contemporaries of all parties agree, but the question of monopolizers is one on which pro-revolutionary historians are strangely silent. Since, for their purpose, the glorification of the revolutionary leaders, it does not bear examination. The truth is probably that the monopolizers were in league with the very men who were stirring up popular fury against monopoly. The leaders of the Orleanist conspiracy. So we're talking Philippe, the Duc de Orleans. The Duc de Orleans at the Palais Royal, where they're having these extravagant... Meals, right? Just drinking champagne, got hookers everywhere. It's just a giant coom pod, right? A giant coom pod for decadent aristocrats who are musing about how, oh, the king's doing such a shitty job. We should be king. We gonna be kings. We gonna be the king. This is what the initial revolutionaries did all day. This is what they did with their time. They hung out in the Palais Royal. And they talked about literature, which is you know, pop culture at the time, right? They talked about decadence, and they engaged in decadence. There was whorehouses all throughout it. They're eating ice cream every day, <laughs> right? They're, 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 they're eating ice cream, getting drunk on champagne all day in, in a giant coom palace, their huge coom palace at the Palais Royal. And those monopolists... Right, who monopolized the grain distribution, withheld it from the people in the cities in order to drive up food, food prices and create tension against the regime. Those were the people who were spreading the propaganda against the regime and stoking the fires of the revolution. That's what's important here. So, the monopolizers were in league with the very men who were stirring up popular fury against monopoly, the leaders of the Orleanist conspiracy. Montjouet asserts that the agents employed by the Duke d'Orleans deliberately bought up the grain and either sent it out of the country or concealed it in order to drive the people to revolt. And in this accusation, he is supported by innumerable contemporaries. They list a bunch of, bunch of gay-ass French names of them contemporaries. I can't even say these names. I'm not, a, I'm not French. I don't parlez-vous le français. Boulot, however, one of the most reliable of contemporaries, considers that the Orleanists 
would have been un unable to create a famine by these ne means, but that they accomplished their purpose by stirring up public feeling on the subject of monopolizers, therefore inducing the people to pillage the grain. The farmers and corn merchants, therefore, fearing that their supplies would be destroyed in transit, were afraid to release them. By this means, a fictitious famine was created. So the famine was fictitious. 1789, famine was fake. It was a, it was a fake ass famine. It was a fake ass famine. What a surprise, right? Who's surprised? I ain't surprised. All right, so what do we see now? A food supply and supply chains that can be intentionally disrupted because they have been monopolized, right? We've been talking about food shortages for two years now. Food shortages for two years. Why do these shortages happen? They happen because intentional shutdowns of parts of the economy. They happen because of arbitrary shutdowns of food processing plants to drive up the cost of production of food. Farmers have been told not to sow crops. Right? We are looking at a creation of an artificial famine starting either later this year or next year by the intentional restriction on the movement of goods Right? A globalized system that's been monopolized through the members of like the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the World Economic Forum. And these economic measures for your health, of course, for your health can be used at any time to create these food shortages. And then the upheaval from that can be directed through propaganda. So this is something you see, you see it over and over and over again. You see it over and over again. Why would you want to create food shortages? Well, as the Orleanists, the Orleanists, working with the Duke de Orleans, who was like the fourth cousin of the king, they created this false famine in 1789. The idea of a famine, which wasn't even a real famine, it was just the threat of a famine, the looming threat of a famine, famine and isolated shortages of bread in some areas. They use that to blame the regime and then bring in the chaos to create a new regime. At first, this idea of the constitutional republic, constitutional monarchy, they were saying, then they ended up, oh, we got to kill the king. And then it just progressed from there. It got very chaotic. And of course, at the end of it, you have the despot. <laughs> you have a despot, you have Napoleon. A secular king calls himself a god emperor. He takes charge. And this happens over and over again. Over and over again. So food shortages used in the French Revolution. We'll do one more quote here from, from Webster's book, The French Revolution, A Study in Democracy, from Nesta Webster, 1919. All right. In spite of a magnificent harvest only six weeks earlier, so it was a huge harvest six weeks before this, 1789 food shortage, the supplies of grain were again declared to be insufficient. The baker's shops were besieged. Working men waited all day to obtain a four-pound loaf and returned empty-handed to their starving families. Hunger is apt to render one light-headed. Under its dizzying spell, many things seem possible that with a well-nourished brain, would rec uh, one would recognize as, as absurd. And so the half-famished dwellers of the faubourgs readily accepted the assurance that the king, the queen, and the aristocrats were at the bottom of the trouble. Governor Maurice thus describes an orator haranguing with the people. The substance of the discourse was, Messieurs, we are in want of bread, and this is the reason. It is only three days since the king has had the suspensive veto and already the aristocrats have bought suspensions and sent the grain out of the kingdom. My awful French accent, I'm sorry. <laughs> to this sensible and profound discourse, his audience gave a hearty assent. Ma foi, he is right. It is only that, oh rare. These are the modern Athenians. So they blame who they want to blame. And what are we going to see now? So the revolutionary fervor that we're seeing worldwide is moving us towards this global revolution. Right? It's a worldwide revolution. The revolution has reached the level of being worldwide. 
So to bring about the fourth industrial revolution where everything is automated and given to us via AI as, you know, for equality and liberty, right? liberty, equality and fraternity, the new system they want to bring us is going to be not subject to the folly of man. It's going to be AI, right? So it's this new deified algorithm. And so tracking everything, tracing everything, and removing humans from the equations, because remember, humans are dirty. You can spread disease. You can spread disease and you can mess up. You're stupid, you're dirty, and you're diseased, they tell you. It's not true, but they tell you that. The new revolution they got to bring about requires that they bring about this technological, this technological solution to the problem of man. And the problem of man is just man is bad. In general, man's just bad, they believe. And that's this inversion of Christianity, whereas in Orthodox Christianity, we believe that man is made in the image and likeness of God. Man's created good. And they say, no, man is bad, and just, you're bad for mummy earth. Mama earth, mammy earth is so sad that you exist. You use too much oil. You just, you won't eat the bugs instead of the meat. You won't eat the bugs instead of the beef. You won't drink cockroach milk instead of real milk. You won't live in a pod. You keep wanting to own private property to have these nasty little children and having families, right? They, it's this total inversion, right? Where they think that everything, everything that is good and is righteous to them, they abhor it. They abhor it. And when you read some of the, you know, the nihilist faction's writings, they're very different from like the moderate liberals, right? right? You, you look at, for instance, uh, like modern day examples, you look at like Musk, Right, who's so kind of you know this uh, liberal billionaire Elon Musk, slightly different, very different, at least externally, reasons for action than a guy like say Bill Gates. Right, Musk seems driven by more of like this kind of Hellenic pagan idea of virtue. Right, he wants glory. He wants to be. He wants the. He wants. He seeks his own glory. All right, which is obviously not a good thing but also the glory of man. We're going to go to Mars. We're going to, we, 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 was, we was Kangs. We're going to be space Kangs. We's, we's going to be space Kangs on Mars. We're going, to be, we're going to have a giant coom palace on Mars. Right? You look at Musk versus Bill Gates, who's like, we've got to exterminate the population. Oh, there's too many people. If we can just reduce human population, oh, if we could just reduce population, we can... Oh. We just get, uh, get rid of 90% of the population and then 10% of us can live scientifically. And, uh, and he hates people. And he hates children. Right, whereas Musk is like, yeah, you know, maybe we're not overpopulated. We're definitely not overpopulated. It's a population collapse. But I'm going to make neural links so that we can, you know, extend our abilities and create this neural networks and all be as gods and, and uh, we can beat the AI gods by becoming AI gods ourselves. Whereas <laughs> Bill Gates is like, let's build the AI grid. We'll build these, this AI, you know, god idol that the people will bend down and bow down before the science, right? And the science will just determine everything that people do, what they put in their bodies and will modify people into oblivion. They both kind of agree on where it's going, but they have a different narrative, they got a different idea, right? Which is when you read like Dostoevsky's Demons, the, the liberals agree with the revolutionaries, right? So the liberal parents and the older generation who are like the, you know, like the, the baby boomers of the 1860s. The book's written, written from the perspective of somebody in like 1872 or 73. And, you know, so the, the, the boomers were the ones who came, came about into adulthood in like the 18... 40s, 50s, 60s, to them, to the you know the uh, the characters in the demons, right? And the liberals, they believe the same things. They believe all the same things. They just want to do it slowly. They're like, yeah, we got to destroy family and all this stuff, but you know we we got to do it slowly. And then some of the liberals are just like, like uh, you know, the governess's wife, who kind of runs the governor. And she's always talking about like women's rights and stuff, women's rights. And but she she lives this decadent life and basically just gossips and engages in whatever strange business she wants to engage in. Um, she wants the same thing, long term liberalism and uh, slow change. But she's gonna save these like crazy nihilist children who just want to burn everything down. 
she's gonna like she's gonna show them the error of their ways. <laughs> like she's she's really she's gonna show them where they're wrong. I'm trying to find this funny passage from her. Um Now, so you have, you have the nihilists who want to burn everything down. You have the liberals who are like, who still agree that, yeah, you know, we're going to separation of church and state, you know, human reason, we can just live reasonably, you know, we can all be equal, all be, you know, vaguely equal, we can all live like, yeah, freedom, liberty, fraternity, equality, but we don't want to, we don't want bloodshed to get there, right? We're going to, we'll do it slow. We'll do it slow. So Yulia Mikhailovna, <laughs> Yulia Mikhailovna is the, uh, the governess's wa- governor's wife. Uh, so this quote from her. Um, you can't be angry at this, she said, if only because you are three times more sensible and immeasurably higher on the social ladder. There are many leftovers of former free-thinking ways in the boy, just mischief in my opinion. But one must be gradual, not sudden. We should cherish our young people. My way is to indulge them and keep them on the brink. <laughs> She's talking with her husband. I'm, I, I'm gonna. I'm, we just indulge them. We keep them on the brink, and we just we keep them from, you know, burning everything down and raping, pillaging, and murdering. And if we just, you know, give them money and keep feeding them and telling them they're beautiful, good little boys, little individual, individual progressives, then they'll, they'll be okay. They'll be okay. We'll just go slowly. <laughs> I mean, it's and it's delusional because she gets walked all over and used by these people. They laugh at her. They mock her. They think she's an idiot. They think, they think she's completely foolish. So they use her to spread propaganda as well. They use her... Uh, or not, well, they use her to spread propaganda because she, st- she has this fet. She has this fet, which is like a fair, right? And it just turns into chaos in the third act of the book. So anyways, Dostoevsky's demon is a really fascinating look into the dynamics of this, of these movements. All right, you have these conspiratorial groups who start these, you know, circles, circles within circles, kind of based on like Babouf's conspiracy of equals, what he called it during the French Revolution. Uh, and then you have the useful idiots who are just the thieves, the students, the liberal prosecutors who feel guilty that they're not liberal enough. (laughs) And that's, these groups can be bound together using compromise, right? Using guilt, using shame, using sentimentality. One of the characters says in Dostoevsky's Demons, and then another character responds to him as he goes, he gives this big list of how you can bond these people together. Sentimentality is like the, the basic driving force of socialism. And the guy who's saying this is even a socialist. He's a, a nihilist, right? He, he's, he even says, I'm a scoundrel. He's like, I'm, I'm not even a socialist, dude. I'm a, I want destruction. I'm a freaking scoundrel, right? He's a coomer. He's, he's a craven coomer. He's a coomer for destruction. And when Piotr is talking to Nikolai, Nikolai says to him, you're forgetting one thing. He says to him, you're forgetting one thing. And this is, this is actually a really important passage. And we're going to talk more about this one later as well, because this passage is very important. Where would that go? So Piotr Stepanovich talks about how you bind these people together, how you can create these revolutionary movements using small cells. And he, you know, in, in this book, he's connected with, or it's rumored that he's connected with the International. And so he says, he gives this list. He gives this this. Where is this? Sorry, I'm trying to find this, the right passage here. There we go. So, he says, how did you manage to spread so many tracts? 
And Piotr says, Where we're going, only four of them are members of the circle. The rest, while they wait, are spying on each other as hard as they can and bringing everything to me. Trustworthy folk, it's all material for us to organize, and then we clear out. However, you wrote the rules yourself. There's no need to explain to you. So what's the goings on? Got stuck? Says Stavrogan. The going? Easy as could be. This will make you laugh. What first of all affects them terribly is a uniform. There's nothing stronger than a uniform. I purposely invent ranks and positions. I have secretaries, secret stool pigeons, treasurers, chairmen, registrars, their adjuncts. It's all very much liked and has caught on splendidly. Then the next force naturally is sentimentality. You know, with us, socialism spreads most, mostly through sentimentality. But the problem here is with these biting lieutenants. You get burned very, every so often. Then come the out-and-out -out crooks. Well, they can be nice folk, very profitable on occasion. But they take up a lot of time, require constant surveillance. Well, the, finally, the main force, the cement that bonds it all, is shame at one's own opinion. There is a real force. And who was it? That worked? Who was the sweetie that labored so that there isn't a single idea of one's own left in anyone's head? They consider it shameful. But if so, why are you bustling about like this? But if it's just lying there, gaping at everybody, how can one help filching it? As if you don't seriously believe success is possible. Hey, the belief there isn't. Uh, it's the wanting that's needed. Yes, precisely with their sort, success is possible. I tell you, I can get them to go through fire if I just yell at them that they're not liberal enough. Fools reproach me for having hoodwinked everyone here with my central committee and numerous branches. He tells them that there's numerous branches everywhere. Nobody really knows how many branches there are, but he tells them, you're a part of something bigger, right? This is bigger than you. You're not liberal enough. You're not going far enough, right? We all, the, we all have the same goals. Why are you going to wait? The more you wait, the more we suffer, the more, oh, the more despotism is going to hurt people. We just got to get it done with, he, he tells him. So he goes, uh, <clears throat> I like that way. I can get them to go through fire if you just tell them that they're not liberal enough. So he talks about this. Well, how do you, how do you bind them together, right? So then he says, um, uh, you're the chief. You're the, f oh, no, 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 where'd it go? So Stavrogan burst out laughing. No, I'd better give you the refrain. Here is your counting off on your, here you are counting off on your fingers what forces make up a circle. All this officialdom and sentimentality, it's good glue, but there's one thing better still. Get four members of the circle to bump off a fifth on the pretest, uh, pretense of him being an informer. And with this shed blood, you'll immediately tie them together in a single knot. They'll become your slaves they won't dare rebel or call you to accounts. Ha, ha, ha. Right, so it takes a dark turn there at the end, right? But that, that, that absolute compromise and that kind of like aspect of like you know, blood sacrifice, the bloodshed, that's what brings about the, the furthering of these, these insane violent outbursts, which are, are not beneficial to anybody, really. Unless you're, you know, some psychopath who just enjoys chaos, which some of these characters are. Some of these revolutionaries clearly are. They enjoy the chaos. So anyways, these, how do you get, how do you get people to bring about the conditions to stoke unrest and whatnot like they're doing with these food shortages? Well, in that passage right there, Pyotr Stepanovich really, in, in Dostoevsky's book, Demons, from I think it was like 1874 or something that was published. An amazing novel. He shows you right there. He says, I can get somebody to jump through fire if I just tell them they're not liberal enough. <laughs> so food shortages. And agitation was used... Also, not just in the French Revolution, but also in the, also in the Bolshevik Revolution. So, 1917, let's see, Father Lev Lebedev, Lev Lebedev, who was, I think, a priest in the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure on his background, but Father Lev Lebedev said, The Masons had de designated February 22nd, 1917 for the revolution in Russia, but on this day, His Majesty was still at Sarksoye Selo, Having arrived there more than a month before from headquarters, and only at 2 o'clock on the 22nd did he leave again for Mogilev. 
Uh, therefore, everything had to be put back for one day and begin on February 23rd. Sorry, that wasn't the part I wanted to be. There it is. By that time, special trains loaded with provisions had been deliberately stopped on the approaches to Petrograd on the excuse of heavy snow drifts, which immediately elicited a severe shortage of bread, an increase in prices, and the famous tales, long queues for bread. The population began to worry. Provocateurs strengthened the anxiety with rumors about the approach of inevitable famine, catastrophe, etc., but it turned out that the military authorities had reserves of food and would allow Petrograd to hold out until the end of the snowfalls. So there was plenty of food. They had reserves. But the propaganda was saying, you're all going to starve. You're all going to starve. They stopped the movement of foods, just like they stopped the movement of supplies to the front, weapons to the front. Right? The head of the department that was responsible for sending armaments to the front line, this is 1917 again, to the front lines on behalf of the Russian state, they halted those shipments. So they created supply chain shortages in order to blame it on the czar, in order to blame it on their political enemies to bring about chaos, right? So uh, they had plenty of provisions that would allow Petrograd to hold out until the end of the snowfalls. Therefore, into the affair, at this moment, there stepped a second very important factor in the plot. The soldiers of the reserve formations who were in the capital waiting to be sent off to the front. There were about 200,000 of them, and since they had, at the end of 1916, been receiving 25 rubles a day. That was a lot. A substantial boost to them, uh, a substantial boost to the revolutionary agitation that had been constantly carried out among them from a secret revolutionary fund. So money was flowing in from bankers in Germany and the United States, funding uprisings, and the soldiers were getting 25 rubles a day by the agitators. Most important of all, they did not want to be sent to the front. They were reservists. And so they, they, they agitated these reservists who were about to be sent to war. And then they created artificial food shortage in order to create a riot. So February 23rd, at a command, 30,000 workers went on strike with the slogans, bread and down with the war. The police had difficulty in dispersing their demonstrators. <laughs> Down with the Tsarist government, they chanted. So, <sighs> they also chanted, long live the provisional government that didn't even exist yet. So they're chanting slogans, long live the provisional government that, they, that didn't even exist. The provisional government that the groups that were associated with the lodges and with some of these you know, other shady aspects of the lodges right, organized in much the same way as Pyotr Stepanovich in Demons, which is, although a fictional work, has so many elements of reality. It's a very real world that's portrayed here in Dostoevsky's Demons. And that same idea, the same circles of insiders, concentric circles of people working together to bring about agitation and ultimately regime change, that same method used in 1917. And of course, food shortages. That was the fuel. That was the fuel for the fire. That was the fuel for the revolutionary spirit that got people to act animalistic. So, quick, another quick quote here from Lubov Millar. Lubov Millar writes, While bread lines in Petrograd got longer, train loads of wheat and rye stood rotting all along the Great Siberian Railway Line. The same was true in the southwestern part of Russia. Even so, there was enough bread to feed the capital. It's from his book, Grand Duchess Elizabeth of Russia. Um, so there was plenty of food. There was a lot of food. So General Voikov wrote, From February 25th, the city's public administration had begun to, to appoint its representatives to take part in the distribution of food products and oversee the baking of bread. It became clear that in Petrograd, at that time, there were enough reserves and flour in the warehouses of Kalashnikov Burs. There were over 450,000 pounds of flour, so that fears about a lack of bread were completely unfounded. The fears were unfounded. So without the treason and without the intentional disruption of food chains, of supply chains rather, you couldn't have had the revolution in 1917. Same it was 1789. So now we're at a point in time 
or these types of agitations can be done at scale worldwide. So a worldwide revolution could, could be influenced by, you know, unfounded claims about frequency and causes of food plant fires. Now, how much, how much of this is just coincidental? Do not know. Do not know. But, you know, we are seeing <laughs> the mass media say, oh, it's a conspiracy theory. It's just crazy. It's all made up. We don't, nobody wants to cause supply chain shortages. Who would even benefit from that? But remember, Schwab, World Economic Forum types, they want to bring out a fully automated, fully autonomous AI-based global governance system where everything you eat, everything you say, everything you do is tracked and traced, where your food is rationed to you according to your social credit score, and where equality, where global equality and liberty and fraternity are achieved through automation. Five reasons the war in Ukraine is a gut punch to the global food system. Ukraine is an agricultural powerhouse and the war is sending shockwaves through global markets. So in Ukraine right now, you've got one of the biggest producers of grain. Got major grain producer, Ukraine, being prevented from exporting its goods. It's prevented from exporting its goods. So could we see famine here and in places like Africa and parts of Europe? All at the same time, we're already seeing a huge increase in the cost of cooking oil, which is, you know, this toxic GMO sludge, <laughs> and soy oil, corn oil, sunflower oil is mostly produced in Ukraine. One of the biggest producers of sunflower oil, sunflower seed oil, is Ukraine. So the regime in Ukraine, being influenced and told by NATO not to allow the opening of sea lanes for grain shipment, not to allow that, not to sow their seeds for the year, not to sow their crops, not to export their crops, that's going to create major upheaval. Now, is it going to be a complete famine? Hopefully not, right? Should we, we definitely shouldn't be so reliant on single crops. That's one thing. We, should be, we shouldn't be so reliant on uh, you know, global food supply chains. We should be focusing on local food production. But because of the way the system is set up right now, shocks in the supply chain can cause upheaval. Now, the solution that they're going to sell us on is obviously it's more automation, it's AI, it's blockchain-based tracking and tracing of everything, and it's going to be rationing. Well, we got to have equality, right? We got to have rationing. So this is where they will go towards. So you're going to see soaring food prices, and you're already seeing this. You were seeing this before as well. All right, the shutdown of the economy. This happened before the Ukraine crisis. I was told by somebody who works for a chemical company who sells fertilizer internationally that he was contacting. All right, this friend of a friend was contacting his clients in Brazil, where they sow a lot of, I think it was corn and whatnot. And they're ask, he's asking them, well, do you need fertilizer? Because I can get fertilizer. I know it's hard to get it right now. I can get it. I got a good price. He's trying to make a sale, trying to close a deal. And they tell him, no, 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 it's all right. We don't need it. Cargill told us not to sow corn this year. We're not going to grow it. We're just not going to grow it. So that's one of the major feed inputs for animals, one of the major inputs for oil, for cooking, for humans. Unfortunate that both of those things are the case, right? If you use proper grazing techniques, right? Intensive grazing, holistic land management is another key word for it. Um, uh, regenerative agriculture is another key word for it, kind of becoming an annoying buzzword now. It's being hijacked, but proper grazing techniques with ruminant animals, you can maximize food production on small amounts of land, improve soil quality, improve grass production, improve milk production and meat production in small areas with minimal input and, and in many cases, zero input of grains. 
So you can grow animal foods, you can grow your important fat and protein sources without grains. Of course, they want to move you towards eating bugs. So fears of famine, soaring food prices, these are triggers of revolutionary sentiment and of pushback, which of course can be used to bring about changes in, in the system. So rising protectionism, uh, uh, sunflower shutdown. So anyway, all right, so this article, pretty interesting, and they are right on point in that you are going to have likely a major push towards destruction of the supply chain that could result in food shortages and fears of famine. Now, will actual famine happen? I hope not. I really hope not. All right, none of this is necessary. None of this is helping anybody except for those that wish for destruction. Right? None of this is good. And none of this is a good thing. So producing foods locally, that's how we stop this. Producing foods locally is how we can stop this. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody needs to produce their own food. That doesn't need to, it mean that everybody needs to, uh, you know, move to a rural area, right? But supporting small farms locally, where right, you can find small producers locally, local food producers, or you can use websites like eatwild.com. Right, eatwild.com, E-A-T-W-I-L-D, eatwild.com. I got no association with them. You can go to eatwild.com and get access to a database of contact information for small family farms and producers of local quality animal foods and plant foods. And you can contact them and get it from them directly. That's how to do it. Right now, if you do want to move towards producing some of your own food, that is possible. Right, that is completely possible. In fact, like uh, the last few days, our breakfast, and it's not like we do this all the time. We don't produce tons of food. We're kind of like hobby homestead homesteaders. We don't live off of our own land exclusively, right? We're not, we're not there. It'd be cool to be able to feed ourselves and eat all of our own food. But the last few days, we have been able to eat our breakfast, right? Or at least our breakfast for the last probably like three or four days has been only from our own land, right? So we've got milk, cheese, yogurt that we produce right, from our own animals. We butchered, slaughtered and butchered a sheep, a little ram the other day. All right, so we had sheep meat, a little bit of liver this morning, some milk, coffee though. I did have coffee. So only the coffee was from somewhere else. And we had our own honey. It was just, that was pretty cool. That's pretty cool. We had some honeycomb. So the kids were eating. They had like chunks of honeycomb. They had yogurt and honey. And then they had some lamb. That was their breakfast. Mine was pretty much the same. So they didn't have honeycomb. But anyways, it's like that. a few days of eating just food from our own land. You can do that. You can do that. It doesn't, you don't have to be a freaking billionaire. You don't have to be a billionaire philanthropist <laughs> to produce food on your own land, right? So we enjoy that. We enjoy that. It's not for everybody, obviously. But you can do it. You can produce a good amount of food in a small area. Right? Using ruminant animals for meat and milk. Swine for meat. Chickens, ducks for eggs. All right? Beekeeping. You don't need tons of land to do these things. You have to have desire. You've got to have patience. And... I mean, you can't expect to, like, make your own money back. <laughs> you can't expect to even make your money back on it, but you can move towards it. You can't move towards it. So uh, you go to realmilk.com as well and get raw milk from local food producers. Eatwild.com. USABeef.org. There you go. Forgot about that one. Is that a good one? Is that a good one? You is USA Beef not work. You have to ask my buddy, uh, my buddy from Garland Farms. You have to ask our boy over at Garland Farms because I'm not. I actually forget. I'm, I'm unfamiliar with 
some of those websites. But eatwild.com is great. That one's fantastic. Realmilk.com. You can get real good quality animal foods there. You know what else? You can also you can also support yourself and support your health by hitting up the homies over at chalk.com. Chalk.com. Get your hands on some of that Tonkat 100 extract. Ooh, look at that. Look at that. Guaranteed to increase your bigotry. Guaranteed to increase your bigotry levels by 50%. But that's only if you use that coupon code BIG50. You're going to get 50% off everything at Tonkat. I'm sorry, at uh, chalk.com. CHOQ.com. Our buddies over there at CHOQ.com. Chalk.com. Get that shilajit extract. Right? Many of our foods, mineral depleted, improving cellular energy production, improving hormone balance, improving central nervous system function. Shilajit, Tonkat 100, and I love the daily. Daily is great for the dudes for balancing hormones. Uh, that Tonkat 100 is a super adaption that's fantastic for men and women, improving reproductive health. Right, not the reproductive health as in Bill Gates version reproductive health. Right, they try they're trying to get you to destroy your reproductive health and destroy life. That Tonkat 100 will help to boost your reproductive abilities. If you know what I mean, improve your hormone function. Whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're a birthing person or a man. You hit them up at chalk.com, chalk.com. You can hit them up at chalk.com. You get 50% off using that code BIG50. 50% off. And remember, they're coming for the supplements too. They're freaking coming for your supplements. So they got that bill. That bill. What is that bill called again? <sighs> Not Gates. <laughs> you got that bill in the, uh, I think it's in the Senate. Introduced by that Democrat. If you live in the U.S., introduced by that uh that Democrat, and it is about getting the FDA to regulate all supplements, dietary supplements for health claims, safety and health claims. All right, so you, you trust those people? You trust the FDA to regulate your friggin' protein powder? I'm gonna tell you your, your whey protein powder? Oh, that ain't safe. That ain't safe. They wanna regulate all friggin' supplements. How crazy is that? Super crazy is the answer. <laughs> That's nuts. All right, so hit them up over at chalk.com, chalk.com, and you can use that code BIG50 to get 50% off store wide, or even better, even better, bigots. You can use BIG53 Life, BIG53 Life, B I G as in bigot, BIG53 Life, L I F E. Big 53 Life, and you're going to get 53% off for life on all subscriptions. That's the best way to go. I love the ashwagandha as well. Good for calming the central nervous system, for decreasing stress and cortisol production. And it's great for the evening. My wife likes to take the ashwagandha in the morning, though. I like it in the evening. It helps you calm down, relax a little bit, get a little bit better sleep. Hit them up at chalk.com, choq.com, Big 50 for 50% off store-wide, or Big 53 Life. For 53% off for life on all subscriptions. All right, so food shortages. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. Piss people off, create artificial shortages, create a situation where people are pissed off, hungry, and acting irrationally and animalistically. Get them out in the streets, get them acting destructive, then sell the false solution, which is already prepackaged of the new system. All right, now they use this to topple the monarchy in France. They use this to topple the czar in Russia. They use this to bring about huge sweeping changes in society. And it does seem like this is being done again. It definitely seems like this is being done again. But they, you know, they say it's factcheck.org. They says it's they say it's unfounded. That's unfounded. You you must be some sort of freaking idiot conspiracy theorist, right? What do you think? What do you think like people sell people send wayfair cabinets? What do you think people send send them wayfair cabinets to the moon? You think people be sending be sending wayfair cabinets to the moon with brain chips, children with brain chips for for Bill Clinton to munch on the moon? What kind of retard are you? What do you think that 
mass media maybe doesn't tell you the truth sometimes? What do you think, that media can be used for, like, propaganda or something? <laughs> what kind of idiot do you have to be to think that food plant fires happening all over the place, which here's a list of them, all over Canada, Mexico, and the United States. You must be some, some sort of an idiot. Look at that. Look at all these fires. Destroyed feed processing facility plants since 2020. So many of these. Nashville, Stockton, California. San Francisco, California. Yucatan, Mexico. New Bedford, Massachusetts. Canada. Grain solo fire. Destroyed cattle, poultry, hogs in Dade City, Florida. Fayetteville, Illinois. Delhi Star food processing plant fire. Grain silo fires all over the place. But, you know, this, this just happens all the time, guys. This just happens all the time. This is normal. This is just, this is okay. This is progress. This is what happens when you have so much progress and freedom. You get little accidents. You get two planes running into food processing facilities within eight days. Right? Trust, trust the plan. It's okay. Bill Gates is going to take care of you. Bill Gates buying up all the farmland after helping to drive the farmers out of business with his GMO heavy intensive chemical input model that he funds, that the Rockefeller Foundation has funded since the 1970s. Right? You, He's buying up all the farmland after making it nearly impossible for farmers to make a profit. And suicides of farmers, the depression among farmers these days with this industrial model is it's just out of control. And he's buying up all the farmland. World Economic Forum's telling you, we gotta, we gotta just live, we gotta move into a pod, guys. You guys wanna stop this? You guys wanna own Putin? You wanna stop Putin's war of aggression? Drink the cockroach milk. Live in the coom pod. <laughs> this is what they tell you, right? I mean, it's absurd. It's obscene. It's, it's ridiculous. Oh, sorry. I, I was, you didn't even see this. There you go. I thought I had this pulled up on screen. But they say, oh, no, you, go, go live in your pod. Don't worry. Look at this huge list. Look at this list of all the food processing facilities destroyed over the last two years. 2020, 2021, now 2022. A lot of cattle, poultry, hog processing facilities burning down. Fertilizer processing facilities burning down. Fertilizer shortages. Beef shortages. Transport chain issues. So, the idea is to get people, in my opinion, in my opinion, and the historical precedent has been set for this, as we saw in the French Revolution, as we saw in the Bolshevik Revolution, artificial shortages caused by a stoppage of a movement of goods into areas can bring about unrest and irrational, inflamed passions in people in these areas, then the revolutionary propaganda can direct that, and the movement can be used as a wedge to bring about sweeping cultural changes, st sweeping structural changes, and what they want to move towards, we know what they want to move towards is more automation. Fourth Industrial Revolution, track, trace, all food, and rationing. Is this avoidable? Absolutely. Is this necessary? Must this happen? Absolutely not. It's ridiculous. Right, so we got to support local food producers, maybe produce some of our own food, right? Produce local food, support local food producers, take care of your health, take care of your families, right? And hey, support the work we're doing here. Share the videos, like the videos. So we're going to keep exploring these ideas. I think the next stream, we're going to talk a little bit. I meant to talk about this today, but the food issue is pressing right now. We're going to be talking about the historical precedent of this like kind of unholy alliance of grain shortages, food shortages, sexual propaganda and pornography, sexual liberation and destruction of the family, and world revolution. So we're going to talk about that next.
maybe maybe a couple days from now maybe a couple days from now so anyways you guys watching this share the videos like the videos hit up chalk.com take care of your body take care of your health high quality natural supplements while they're still legal all right get yourself a subscription you can use that big five three life big 53 life big 53 life for all the bigots, you can get 53% off all subscriptions for life. Link is in the description. Link is in the chat. Link will be in the comments as well. And then, hey, where, where y'all? Where y'all's tips over there on Rockfin? What's up, Rockfin bigots? You guys used to be. What, what happened to all our all our generous tippers? You guys, we got a test of the two dollar tip button. Remember, guys, you can even do a ten dollar tip. You could even do a fifty dollar tip. You can even drop hundred dollar tips over there on Rockfin. We love you guys sharing the videos, liking the videos, but we also really appreciate when you support us via those tips. There we go, Sharon dropping a $10 tip. Thank you, Sharon. Sharon Limbach with that $10 tip. Much appreciated. Let me see. So we, we know that the $10 tip button works. We gotta get that. We got you guys wanna you guys gotta test out that $20 tip, that $50, that $100 tip. If you're watching on YouTube, you may drop a tip via Stream Labs. The Stream Labs is in the description. You guys on YouTube, you guys are not like the, the Rockfin bigots. The Rockfin bigots almost always support YouTube bigots. I don't know what's up with y'all. I don't know what's up with all y'all YouTube bigots. Y'all don't be dropping those tips anymore, but that's okay. Share the videos and like the videos. All right? Do that. Do that. Because the algorithm will not help us. Yet we must be our own algorithm over there on YouTube. We got to share the videos ourselves. So y'all like the video, share the video, make comments down below, drop your comments down below. Take care of your families, take care of your health. Don't let them freak you out and whip you up into a fervor. I'll see you guys next time.